All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're here with a man who, if you're a Space Busters fan, needs no introduction because he's somehow made his way into at least 12 or 14 films since early 2020. Um, but it's not... <laughs> 12 or 14. <laughs> I, I think maybe more. And wow. you've somehow managed to make your way into the new one I'm working on with Dr. Mark Bailey. So uh, that, that that's one more. But uh, it's Dr. Tom Cowan. Tom, thanks for, for coming on. It's great. I've really been looking forward to speaking with you. Great. Thanks. It's good to talk to you again, Steve. Appreciate everything you're doing. You make some great stuff. So, Thank you very much. So do you. Well, yeah, I found you a long time ago, and I, I dare say you're one of my teachers. And uh, I, I, I've looked up to everything you've done, <laughs> especially on what we're going to speak about today is even in the early days of my filmmaking, I was still under the impression that biology as we know it, cellular biology is real, and you know, uh, DNA. And uh, I, I made some mistakes in my early films that you've been teaching me like, no, 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 hang on. Uh, this, is, this is all theoretical. And what we're gonna talk about today, which is exciting, is your new biology curriculum which is great because the timing couldn't be better, in my opinion. All of us for years now have been exposing what isn't and what's false and what's not real and uh, certain political agendas. And I think people are now at the stage going, yeah, we get it. So what do we do about it, right? And I think that's why I'm really excited about what you're doing. I, this new biology curriculum, I dare say, is pretty radical. <laughs> it's a pretty radical thing. But the first question is, I think people would have is like, Tom, why do we need another health curriculum, right? We we know allopathic medicine is dodgy, but we have homeopathy, naturopathic, shamanic medicine, acupuncture, witch, witch doctors. Why are you doing this? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, it's funny when uh, you didn't say it exactly like this, but people say, Oh, yeah, I believe everything you say, you know, it's I'm with you 100%. And I always think to myself, I don't even believe 100% of what I say. <laughs> I, you know, it's like I, I have sometimes conversations with my wife, and she says, Did you just make that up? <laughs> I say, Of course, I just made it up, you know. <laughs> but so l let me just say in in for the next 45 minutes, uh, I, I will try to differentiate when I'm saying fact versus my own speculation, right? Because I think that's important. Some things are facts and some things are not. And I don't mind people speculating, but I, I would rather they say when they're speculating because, you know, that we all do that. So I agree. You're very logical too. What I like about you is, you have intuition and just logic, you know, you just break, you don't take BS. You say, hang on, that doesn't make sense. And I, I get the feeling that's where this is coming from. All of your experience in medicine, you must have along the way said, hang on, <laughs> something's yeah. wrong. Here. Well, I started even before I went to medical school. I wouldn't, I, I, I was sort of groomed to be a doctor, but I didn't like it. I didn't like how they thought. And so I, and until I realized there was another way to do medicine, I wasn't going to go when I did realize. So I, I think the way to answer that is maybe by looking at, at a few situations and contrasting like allopathic medicine and then sort of natural, holistic, or sometimes functional medicine, and then what we're calling new biology curriculum or medicine. So what would you learn? So let's take a simple thing like depression, right? So depression is supposedly a, a disease, right? And they, I say that because it's in the DSM-8 or whatever number they're on manual of, that's the list of psychiatric diseases. So therefore it must be a disease, right? Because it says depression. And so the question, and so what we're looking at is, and, and here's, a, here's a speculation or a hypothesis, and you can actually say whether you even agree with this or not, because 
I do, but I would say I can't prove it. I would say that you can't build a healthy anything. And I'm talking about a person, a life, a community, a world based on untruths. Now, again, I can't prove that because you could say, well, you could have a relationship that is based on that people hate each other, but they don't say that to each other. And maybe that'll work, right? There's a lot of people have tried. I'm, I could tell you that. Uh, but, but I don't think that's the best way to have a healthy relationship, right? So that's a, that's a speculation, which I can't prove. But so, so the question then is, how does, they, how does this doctor, he or she, come up with this diagnosis of depression? So here's how it works. So I've actually seen studies that show that when you go to a normal doctor, you have approximately 37 seconds before they interrupt you. And I can tell you that I was an ER doctor for a while, and I don't think most people made it to 37 seconds. <laughs> they, they came in and said, my arm, I fell and boom, I was done because then I was going to do an x-ray and find out what's wrong with their, if they have a broken arm. I didn't need to hear any BS about their dog trip them or anything. <laughs> I didn't care. I just, it's your arm. So a person comes in, doctor says, what's up? He says, oh, I'm really depressed. And in a way, that's all they need to hear, right? person's depressed, that's the diagnosis, then, then you do what you need to do. Because in medicine, it's all about getting the diagnosis and matching the treatment. Got, maybe they let them go on. Yeah, I, you know, my job isn't going well. I'm not getting along with the missus. And, and I'm, you know, I'm a little financially stressed. And yeah, I'm just really depressed. Now, here's the assumptions behind that encounter. Number one, depression is a disease. It's not an experience of life. Like this guy has a crappy life, right? And so he doesn't feel good about the way things are going. And this, so that's number one. And the second is the cause of his depression disease is a serotonin deficiency. That's, and so because of that, he hears the diagnosis from the patient, right? He doesn't know anything about this person. He says, you have a diagnosis of depression. It's caused by serotonin deficiency. Take Prozac or, you know, one of the other ones, SSRIs, to make you have more serotonin. Come back in a month. Tell me how you're doing, right? So those are the assumptions and the, and the, the course of action based on that thinking. Now, interestingly, here's typically what would happen. A guy comes back in a month. How are you feeling? Oh, feel much better. Yeah, how's your life doing? Well, the wife left me. I got <laughs> fired from my job. I went bankrupt. And I gained 30 pounds because I'm sitting on the couch all day. So, <laughs> but I don't give a shit about it. I any. don't give a shit. <laughs> I'm healed. Thank you. Yeah. So, so you, you might say, so what makes you think you're, I just don't feel so bad anymore. <laughs> right. So he's, he's fixed. Right. Now, the problem with that encounter is a, there is no diagnosis of depression. That's an experience. And people have been trained to say that. And B, and here, here is a fact, this is not speculation. There is no evidence that a chemical in your brain called serotonin has anything to do with the symptom of, of feeling bad. That has been disproven. Even you know our friend Kelly Brogan has published studies on that. There is no evidence that that's true. And the evidence that they will give you, well, well, I gave the person a chemical like Prozac and they got better, is supposedly proof that it's caused by serotonin. In other words, if somebody is something and you give them cocaine and they feel better, that means they had a cocaine deficiency and you <laughs> fixed it, right? That's the proof. 
So that's obviously nonsense, right? So yes. <laughs> my, my conclusion of working, you know, I never really did that, but I was part of that system for, you know, decades is, is the problem is the assumptions. They assume there's a disease, which there isn't. They assume a cause of an imaginary disease, which has not only never been proven, it's been disproven. And even that's not even getting into whether nerves have synapses, which they don't, and whether there's neurotransmitters, which there aren't. They don't. Yeah, exactly. So that's even a part, those are even assumptions underlying the whole serotonin thing. Okay, so that's obvious. That 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 one's let's just call it BS. <laughs> uh, so then okay, so you don't you're a, a little bit more enlightened person. I'm going to go to my holistic functional doctor. So you go in, say, you know, I'm really depressed and tired and he listens to you and you do a questionnaire about 20 pages of all the symptoms and got low libido and etc. And so then he says, okay, we need to do some tests. So he does approximately, he or she, I keep saying he, but could be anybody, uh, about four or $5,000 worth of tests on urinary amino acids and neurotransmitters and a whole lot of other things. How much lithium is being excreted in your hair, except it wouldn't be much in you. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> so uh, now, what are the assumptions? Well, first of all, there's a disease called depression, right? He's, they still believe that. Second of all, that all these chemicals will somehow tell you what's wrong with the person. I mean, if you just examine like one, urinary amino acids, so they're too high. You could say, well, they're too high, which is good because you're excreting the extra. You could say that's bad because that means your body has too many of those amino acids. Uh, you can actually say just about anything you want because nobody has ever demonstrated that the amount of amino acids in your urine has anything to do with an experience of being sad. Which is right? probably your mother died and you're three months behind on your rent. Like, that's crazy. Yeah, the same with the Prozac. It's as if it's not okay to be sad. Right. Which is, your body is telling you something's wrong. You need to deal with an emotional trauma. Same with disease, which we'll get into. I never call it disease. I call it dis-ease because your body has to have a way to show you that you're deficient or something's wrong right. so that you know to fix it, right? Like if you broke your leg and you didn't, it didn't hurt when you walked on it, you would just hurt it more because right. you would feel well, it. You're, right? you're, you're jumping the gun and getting into new biology, which is, oh. <laughs> the, the point is, there is still in, in almost all of what's called alternative or holistic medicine, the assumptions are almost identical. There is a disease, you are a chemistry set, you have neurotransmitters, we can figure out where they're off and fix them. And so they give you, you know, $500 worth of supplements to take every month. And, you know, the results are, let's just say variable. Now, in what I'm saying is we want to base medicine on reality, not unproven or disproven assumptions. So the reality is there's something going wrong with your life, just like you said, Steve. Like, so you spend a certain amount of time saying, so what happened to you? And, and I actually learned in my practice that people will go back if you let them to what happened. Some it's just I was fine and then two weeks ago my dog died and now I feel sad and that's perfectly normal. They don't have a disease. They don't need anything except someone to say, yeah, I hear you. You know, I, I that's like sad. <laughs> or it could be that you were abused as a child and you were starved and, and you know, there's a whole lot of stuff to unpack and, and, and whatever it is, you stick with the real story of the patient, which is an individual uh, 
explanation of what happened in their life. Now, some of it's like psychological slash emotional, and some of it's, yeah, I was fine, and then I decided to only eat raw beets. How come? Well, because that makes you feel better. So what happened? Oh, man, I couldn't, I felt like shit after that. So the problem <laughs> is you, you made a choice to do something which I would say is wonky, and it didn't work. And so <laughs> you have a physical deficiency, like, right? So that's a physical problem. So it's not like saying, is it a mental problem or emotional or a physical it's it's whatever it is, and probably a mixture of all of those. Now, once you find the story, then you try to address, or you might even say with the person fix, like if it's beets, you'd start eating regular food. <laughs> if it's abuse or your dog, you know, you might get a new dog, or maybe that would, you know what I mean? There's a way to address, and some people may be zinc deficient, right? It, yeah. That could be the story. And that's the story. That's so none of that. And, and by the way, if you say somebody's zinc deficient, you better know how you figure that out. Because that's a tricky one. Because it's very complicated to do to even know whether minerals stay the same in your body as it is what you put in and it's complicated. And so with every situation, you just go through that process. You can do it with flu. You know, the regular people think it's a virus, so they give you an antiviral or a vaccine. The alternative people think it's a virus, so they give you vitamin C. Uh, we know it's there's no evidence for any of that stuff. Yeah. What happened to you? And then you deal with that. That's what I mean by new biology. Yeah, which is great. And I think so pretty one of the things I notice is, that, you know, it's the circle. Uh, oh, no, it's it's German new medicine. It's all emotional. You, it can't possibly yeah. be uh, poisoning from the chemicals in your shampoo and your yeah. dishwashing soap and all that. Or no, 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 it's all poisoning. They, everyone's no, no, it's an energy imbalance. It's acupuncture. No, it's a uh, cell salt deficiency. Yeah. And I think kind of maybe what you're doing, am I wrong? Or are you, you're marrying everything saying it's, you're all, it's one or the, it's not one or the other, it's combinations or some, or maybe none. Is that what you mean? Yeah, that's actually a great way to put it because, you know, through my life, and I've been doing this for almost 40 years uh, and I wouldn't, this is an exaggeration, by the way, I, I learned to pay really close attention to when people quote, lie or exaggerate, because there's always something really juicy in that. The person who comes in and says, oh, my foot is killing me. Well, your foot isn't killing you, right? Because if it was, I would say to cut your foot off. <laughs> uh, but it probably hurts really bad sometimes, right? And then you have to you have to dissect when it hurts and what happens. It's because my wife stomps in my foot in the morning. That's when it hurts. And so then you know the problem. So uh, anyways, so I'm going to exaggerate here. I, I have learned a, at least some about pretty much every medical system there is. You know, I can get by as a homeopath and an herbalist and anthroposophical doctor and German new medicine and, you know, herbs and food and all the rest and none of them fit right with me it just like you say it's only emotional it's only so i would ask people breast cancer it's only trauma based with sex or something so i have people with breast cancer and i go through their whole life not a single trauma that they anybody could remember or anything and i just said Screw it. It's not right. <laughs> yeah. Because meanwhile, they were <laughs> essentially, you know, like eating arsenic or something all the time. And it wasn't emotion. I mean, everything's emotional, right? But it, but right. there's a lot of chemical. Yeah. It, I mean, you know, there's something to Bruce Lipton's work. I don't like the word epigenetics because genetics are BS too. But yeah. there's, as Bruce Lipton always said, when you're in love, you meet someone for the first time. He said, are you sick? 
you're not yeah. even you're still eating arsenic and dish soap and all that but you're walking around so there's i think they they all interact and if you get in a deficient mental and physical state you start to get a dis-ease what your body is just telling you right it's time yeah I think your background is great because there will be a lot of people saying, who the hell is Tom Cowan think he is? He can come out with a new <laughs> yeah, right. medical I curriculum. think that too. Yeah. But uh, let's take you back to, uh, I think you went to Michigan State, right? For yes. holistic medicine, but it wasn't really holistic. Can Take us back and tell, tell us how did this happen in your head? Because we all talk to, uh, I'm not going to name names, but there are certain allopathic doctors out there who are still talking nonsense, indoctrinated nonsense. You can show them mountains of evidence about the boogeyman, invisible, this and that, and they can't get it. How did you not fall into the trap? What happened? I mean, I I don't know exactly, but my, you know, my, my going theory on this is I grew up in a, what I would call a Jewish ghetto. But, you know, Jewish ghettos are a little bit more high, you know, like it was not a, uh, I mean, I lived in a brick shack, basically, when I grew up, but, but I, my parents had a lot of friends, and we were in a kind of a group. And I'd say 10 of these friends who I grew up with and played baseball with and played softball and basketball and went ice skating and everything. They were high powered doctors. Like, as an example, one of them invented uh, the technique of doing laser surgery in gynecology, right? So that's a big, sh and he was well known gynecologist all over Southern Michigan and probably further. Another was head of gynecology at, uh, uh, sorry, head of oncology at, you know, a big me Detroit Metropolitan Hospital. Another one was a sort of well-known urologist and on and on and on. And so I grew up with these people. And, and one of the things I realized is like golf was everything to them. And I was the best golfer in the group. And in fact, they lived to win the club championship of this Jewish country club. And they wouldn't let me play until I was 15. Right. Because that's, you know, that's like and I was 15 and I came in and I won easily, like no problem. And I realized not I wouldn't say I was conscious then, but I I thought I the reason I won not only was I certain skill, but I, I could outthink them on the golf course. So I realized right then I would I, again, I don't know if I could have said it that these brilliant doctors, they, they were frauds because the thing they wanted most, not the gynecology, was to win the golf championship. <laughs> the Jewish golf championship. For the <laughs> yeah, Great. and I, and, and, and so I, I went into this, you know, not having like awe of, like normal doctors and way they think and all that. And, and it's partly probably my nature, whatever that is. And so I just didn't buy it. And it, you, I just, you can't say shit that's not logical and expect me to just believe it. Now, the trick is you, when you learn medicine, you don't even realize that it's illogical. You just, you, you know, you just hear it and it seems right, but you, you don't know, they never go into like how this was found, right? And so you never actually get a chance to hear the logic. And so eventually as I went through, you know, how do you know the heart pumps the blood? They never talked about that. They just assume it's like God said the heart pumps the blood. So we all know it and know to ask why, because we don't know who, who said that or who discovered it or what their evidence was. Nothing. They, you know, you ask your doctor, you know, how do they know there's viruses? They don't have a clue. Yeah. Not a clue. Who, who, who came up with the method? 
Who decided the heart is a pump? Who first identified DNA and how did they do it? If you go and read Watson and Crick's, you know, nature paper, you know, it's all about the spiraling of the double helix. And it says right in there, we assumed a, a angle of, what do you mean you assumed? That's the whole point is to measure the angle so you can see what it is. And I mean, I never read, nobody ever said, you guys should read this stuff and figure out where this all came from. So, I mean. I mean, I hear, I hear new age people saying, we're going into a phase where we're going into 12 dimensional strand DNA. I'm like, there's no proof. There's even two of them. <laughs> How are you going to get 12 if you don't even know you actually have two? <laughs> I mean, it's pretty you know, dodgy, you know. I, I heard the other day someone who was giving a talk. I don't listen to many talks, but they they talked about uh, water, which I like to talk about, being able to what they called quantum bilocate, right? Now, uh, so here's the thing. Quantum bilocate, anything with quantum supposedly is true, right? And bilocate means... The thing, the thing is in two places at the same time. <laughs> I don't know about you, Steve, but as far as I've seen, there's nothing I know of that's in two places. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so I asked her, how did they figure that out? And the answer, of course, no idea. So I went and looked at the study. I mean, it's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're talking about maybe magnetic field potential, you know, like the ether, if they're playing tug yeah. of war and you're in France and I'm in Denmark, we pull the rope and we move at the same time. But that's, well, quantum physics is theoretical. Everything's a yeah. theory. It's modest. I, I keep saying, yeah, how, if it's true, why is it theory? It should be fact. Yeah. <laughs> but one model. of the things that interested me, like you were talking about... Um, so I used to work for the healthcare companies back in the 90s, uh, some very big ones. I'm not going to name them on camera because I'm going to slag them off. <laughs> I don't want to get sued, but um, we brought in, the Europeans won't understand this, but you, you would know the PPO model came in. We had the HMOs and the PPOs. Basically what we did is because we we're trying to make massive profits. So we say, well, Tom, you're charging too much for this visit or this or that. Um, we're going to regulate what money you get for the visit, but because you're on our list, we're going to send you 20 more patients than normal, you know, so you'll get more patients. And I'm sure there's bean counter actuaries somewhere who worked it out. Like, how do we get it, the deal sweet enough where he'll take it or she, but you know, the problem was, as Andy Kaufman was saying, now some of these doctors see a patient for six minutes. And what I like about your story, if you could talk about it, is your approach is you need to talk to them for a lot more than that to get, as you say, to cut through the BS and find out what is really making you ill, right? How, how did you come up with that approach? And can you talk about that approach? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, there's some interesting things about that, because I actually uh, don't agree that one of the problems with medicine is that doctors don't have time to see their patients. I, it, I was in a group of about 70 doctors uh, a few years ago when I was still in California. And interestingly, the guy asked the group, 70 doctors, mostly middle-aged, you know, how many of you have children? Basically, everybody raised their hand. How many of you would want your child to go into medicine? Three raised their hand out of 70. So that tells you a lot right there. And then he went on about how medicine, the re, he said, the reason you guys hate medicine so much, which most of them did, was because they don't give you time to be with your patients and really get to know them and find out what the problem is, et cetera, and all that. Sort of like what, what you were suggesting. Uh, I didn't say anything at the time because I didn't want to like get into it, but I don't, I actually don't agree with that. Now, here's why. Imagine you go to the doctor and you have a sore throat, right? The game the doctor plays is 
find the diagnosis, give match the medicine with the diagnosis or the procedure. That's it. That's that is the game they're playing. So person comes in sore throat. Doctor thinks it's either strep, which I can find with a culture, mono, which you have to do a blood test, or it's a virus. Don't worry about it. That's it. And so he does a throat culture, does a mono spot, and and essentially does what the results tell him to do. If you said to that doctor, okay, you have uh, two days to talk to this person and find out about their life and everything. After five minutes, he's got nothing to say to the person. N no information. He doesn't care whether you have braces or you eat only donuts or he doesn't know anything about that. He doesn't care if your wife is beating you. He, none of that. It's either strap mono or get out of here, right? That's all there is in life to him. So you could give him six weeks to be with that person. And he doesn't know, you know, anything more than in the first three minutes. So it, I don't think that solution would help. Right? Because he doesn't, if you say I have inflammation in my joints, it's either rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, lupus, or you're making it up. And so he does the blood test, gives you the drug based on what he finds. He doesn't care if you're eating crap and and never exercise, <laughs> right? Every once in a while, somebody will go rogue and say, you know, you should try to walk every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, you're kind of fat. Yeah. <laughs> but we we were drilled into it's never the patient's fault. It doesn't matter what they don't say it's because they do this or think that it's genes, viruses, or you know, bacteria or bad luck. That's it. That's why people get sick. So just figure out which of those. So that model came about because of the way they do medicine. And for whatever reason, I re I just in medical school, they, they used to use me as a model for how to question people. Not that I, you know, I, I, but because a person would come in and I would say, walk me through the day. Okay, I wake up at seven. And, and then uh, what do you eat then? I eat good food. I don't want to know that you eat good food. You tell me what you eat and I'll decide whether it's good food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I uh, just eat normal donuts, not powdered yeah. sugar on them. <laughs> right. So I would go through how they live. You know, what do you do? What do you think about how are you getting along with your family? What kind of house do you got wallpaper on your on your house? You know, with somebody, what do you do with your lawn? Everything. So I wanted to know what, where, and out of that came this whole strategy of, and, you know, it does take a while, but it doesn't take as long as you think. Once you get good at it, you know, and then I, I learned from Carl Rogers. He was a sort of humanistic psychiatrist that if you question people, but never ask them why, like, why do you have a sore throat? They don't know. And it gets them out of uh, that intuitive side of their understanding. I got a sore throat yesterday, it hurts really bad. I go through when it happens, how it happens, what it feels like, all the details, but it's my job to know why. And then I would tell the story back to them. So you said that you were fine and then you got a flu shot and next thing you know, you're paralyzed. Is that right? Yep, that's right. I think I know what happened to you. You got the flu shot paralyzed. <laughs> this is not Guillain-Barre syndrome. This is poisoning paralysis of your nerves, uh, of your, yeah, of your motor nerves from uh, a poison. And then, and that's why there, there's no compliance problem because the person inevitably says, so how, you have to tell me how to get that poison out of my body. Got it. 
which is a perfectly reasonable question, right? That's what I would ask. Yeah, I see. That's what happened to me. Uh, I shouldn't have only ate beets. Tell me what to eat. Fine. Here, do this. You'll be good. And right. It, it was so very won't simple. Come to that conclusion, right? Until you walk them through it, it does never occurs to them. It might have been that shot. Yeah. Or the beats, right? They, eat, but they do know, don't they? Subconsciously, they know. you just have to unlock it, sort of. And, and you know how I knew Steve that they know. Uh, I, and again, I stole this from Carl Rogers. He said, "If you're questioning somebody, and you get to this point." And then you say it back to them. So here's what they say. One of two, one of two things, which is, I knew it. Two, people told me it wasn't true. Right? And then the, the, the sort of coup de grace comes. They either start laughing or crying. 100% almost. That, because people say, that it's like uh, they say, <laughs> It's a release. Like I knew this was the problem. I mean, it's either funny or it's tragic. You know, sometimes it's sad because they went 20 years knowing that it was that flu shot that got them in the bad state. And every neurologist told them it wasn't. I've had story after story like that. And so, and, and I can't emphasize none of what I'm saying is theoretical. Right. I'm not getting any theories of neurotransmitters and how nerves work. It's this is what happened to you in your life. We know that certain poisons cause neurological symptoms. That's what happened to you. Exactly. I mean, I can tell too, you're you're the kind of person who doesn't mind rocking the boat. And I think you actually get off on it. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. But uh you know, you probably even piss off a lot of people in the homeopathic, naturopathic, because again, it's still a medicine based thing about the symptoms. Sometimes, you know, what you're saying is, let's get to the cause, like, you know, who who cares about the disease or the treatment right now? What what is this? And that's the problem we don't get with most medical systems, even the allo or the homeopathic, it's still a medicine based uh you know, doctoring, would you agree with that? Or what, what's yeah, different I mean, about your program than like someone says, well, I got a naturopath or a homeopath. What would be different with the new biology curriculum? Yeah, I mean, most naturopaths and, you know, in Chinese medicine, homeopath, I don't want to overgeneralize here, but they basically believe in the disease model. They believe in the categorization of diseases. And then they'll have a slightly different view of the cause of that depression, like it's your liver flow or chi in your liver, which, and, and I, I think you can't build a healthy medical system based on flawed thinking. And there is no disease hep C or, or depression or even cancer. It's not like we think it is. Now, homeopathy is a little different because in so you could say the story is the plant. So if you take the belladonna, it makes your eyes wide open, et cetera, and sore throat. If somebody comes in with that story, that is their medicine. And that is the diagnosis. Uh, that's what now why they got that is they don't get into that. And so we would. But I mean, homeopathy is is a profound way of seeing, you know, the interaction of the net of the world outside and a human being or an animal. So, I mean, I, and so is Chinese medicine, you know, they're talking about energy flows, but I, I do think it needs to be taken this further step, which is, you know, what happened to the person? Because I can tell you 35 years of doing this, you know, every week, practically, the thing that helped people the most was telling their story and hearing it uh, spoken back to them in a way that makes them understand, now I know what happened to me. It was the most profound thing I ever did, more than medicines, exercise, diet, anything. Because then they did things differently. You know, whatever it was that needs to be changed insofar as they could, they would change it.
Yeah, I think that's one of the problems we have is we're disempowered when we go to allopathic doctors. Yeah. They don't tell you what's wrong and how you should help yourself or that you're the cause. Like you said, if you don't tell that person, you're the reason you're like that. It's the donuts you eat every morning. And right. You know, stop taking a shower with an, a neon orange shower gel. Look at the back, dum-dum. <laughs> you don't think that's going in your skin. Uh, so I think what you're saying, yeah, one of the things is, uh, what's the old saying, physician heal thyself, you know, yeah, I like that, that approach that you're participating in your own healing. And actually, that will bring us to um, so we I, are, it, doctors well, are actively discouraged from doing that. Why? Why? <laughs> well, a that the teachers of medicine don't know anything about it themselves. So they would be exposed, right? Nobody wants to be exposed. Like you, if you say, do you think that neon soap gel is bad for it? He doesn't even know what that means. So he would be exposed at not knowing his business. And second of all, uh, what would happen is people would be empowered to change things for themselves and, you know, and therefore not be interested in taking stuff to suppress their symptoms. I mean, the way I see it, it should be extremely rare. And I mean, extremely rare for a person to be taking a pharmaceutical drug. I mean, I would go months without prescribing a single one. I mean, even a year, not one. Because nobody needed, nobody needed, and yet most people are on, you know, two, 10, six, whatever, every day of their life. So they don't, I mean, they've been, they've been brainwashed into not thinking about r reality. And they just, their whole life is theoretical models, which they don't even understand how they came about. Yeah, exactly. I noticed that even when I go home to the States, you know, to visit my family, they're all on 20 pills of this, that and the other. Like, you know, in, in Denmark, it's people aren't really so pharma crazy, but they're still on them here. But yeah. they're on for everything. And I'm like, why? Just take a nap, dude. Open the window, <laughs> you know, like right. drink some water. Um, but that brings us. Uh, so you in, in your new curriculum, you had these four assumptions or tenants, I would call them. And the number one is what you're talking about. And you said the body is self-healing, self-regenerating. That's one of the principles, right? Of this new biology. Because people are going to say, what? What do you mean new biology? What yeah. new biology? <laughs> what are you talking? What's new about biology, right? Right. Well, it's a new understanding. But it's it's actually, in some ways, it's a misnomer because it's an old understanding that has been forgotten. And we went into this cell, DNA, human living beings are chemistry sets, and we're not, and that's the problem. So we went into this model-based theoretical stuff, which uh, isn't working. And so, yes, how do I know that the body is self-regenerating? You get a cut, it heals. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Exactly. Yeah. And T.C. Fry and Herbert Shelton, they were talking, uh, what was her name? Flor Florence Nightingale. Yeah. She just opened the windows and let some fresh air in. and there's like yeah. 30 guys breathing out and farting toxins all over each other. And she opens the window and they all get better. Yeah. No medicine, just fresh yeah. air. Right. So you're right. This has been known. I think the other thing too, I can remember growing up, we always had like grandma's remedies, you know, like, oh, you, you uh, take some castor oil and, you know, you get the like uh, diuretics and stuff. It's like the grandma recipes have still been there all along and they work. That's another reason, you know, this works Yeah, is because grandma's recipe works and your drugs don't. You're, you're on those drugs for life and they yeah. want you that way. You're not on castor oil for life. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, tell, tell, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. The allopathic drugs quote work by suppressing your body's healing mechanisms. You know, it's the you get a splinter in your finger, you take uh, this the pus comes to get it out. They give an antibiotic because they think the pus is the disease. 
and it's just and that's bron bronchitis and pneumonia they think the cough is the disease it's not it's the healing mechanism so new in new biology it's it's really getting away from that understanding of what the human being is and then the treatments should all insofar as possible work with what your body is trying to do your body is trying to cough you make it easier to cough that's it yeah and i think cancer is the number one offender of that because that has the biggest victim mentality. I I caught cancer. <laughs> You're like, yeah. there's not cancer flying around and you were the unlucky one who caught it. Yeah. You, you to have something in your body that your needs to be protected and wrapped up and you have tumors. And, um, and, and that's one of the things I learned from a guy called a biochemist called George Washington Carey, Dr. Carey. He's, and this is one of your tenants. Uh, he said, your symptom is not a disease. It's a communication strategy in a way right. of your body telling you, hey, something's in balance here, something's wrong. And if you don't feel this pain, you won't know it and you'll just carry on yeah. doing what you're doing. Is, do you agree with that? A hundred percent. Symptoms are communication strategies. And it's just like if you go through your life every time your friends and your partner and your wife and husband or whatever wants to say something to you and you say no. I don't want to hear about it. Uh, you're not going to have a good life. And yeah. that's what we're doing with our body. We're trying, we're saying, we don't want to hear about what you have to say. And so if you're lucky, the body will keep saying it. If you're not lucky, the body will say this guy, this person doesn't listen. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm out of here. And yeah. then you're in real trouble. Especially that's the dangers of stuff like ivermectin, for example. Yeah, you feel better, but that's because, you know, it stopped you from detoxing the toxins. Yeah. Well, the, the danger is, yeah, you might be able to go another year. Now you've got ivermectin in you, which is highly toxic. Go on to pub chem. It says it right there. <laughs> Don't eat this stuff. But the problem is the next time you're going to take ivermectin again because you're going to go, it worked last time. Yeah. You know, and you do that three times in a row, and then you're you're looking at some, you know, you're in trouble down the yeah. road. I think that's one of the problems. Um, so for this curriculum, and, and, and that the you're, interesting yeah. point about that is these are philosophical questions, right? This is about the conception of reality that you have, and they have a different conception. They think if it stops the symptoms, that's good. Doesn't matter. It's just good. And that's a very short-sighted, inaccurate view of, of, of life. Yeah, because the symptom is actually a result of healing. Yeah. But we keep calling it, as you said, you call, if you call the healing the disease, yeah. then you take a medicine to what you think is attacking disease, you're actually attacking the healing. Right. <laughs> Which that's is it. That's the dumbest thing you could ever do in your life. But we all do that. Yeah, we, we all did. do it. So who's this new biology curriculum? It's not for people like me. I'm not a doctor. Who is this for? And then how does this work? Like, so will people be able to find your network and then, you know, say they don't want to go to an allopathic quack or something? How does this all work? What you're setting up? I mean, the idea was, you know, before I die, I should probably uh, systematically teach this method. I mean, it sounds a little arrogant to me, but anyways, so I was convinced that I should do it. And so essentially teaching people who want to be, you know, some sort of practitioner and maybe even people who just want to learn about health and healing. Uh, and so there's a systematic approach. You know, how do you talk to people? What, what do you think when somebody comes in with a sore throat? Like what's going on? Is it a virus, right? You know, is it strep, you know, or is it the braces which change the metallic, you know, field in your mouth, you know, and then you got degraded tonsils and then the bacteria eat them. Then, so you go through how to think about all these different disease sort of modules, you know, and we, we have group sessions and talk about it and talk to people individual, individually if they need to get it. And by the end of that, you should have a pretty good understanding of 
of how to think about this uh, biology, what's wrong with the old one, how to study it, a basic understanding, and then if you're a practitioner, how to implement this into your practice and get out of this $5,000 of lab tests and functional, it's your zinc and your hair and all this theoretical model-based stuff, which doesn't do anybody any good. Right. And then, so you will have a network, like, for example, if we want to find one of your yeah, trained right. doctors in our area so we can go on there and yeah. and find them, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a it's a massive endeavor. <laughs> it's like, good on you for doing it, man. But <laughs> it's, it's my son who really, he, he, <laughs> he he's the driving for i wouldn't do anything if it was me. <laughs> yeah. well i think it's great like we said you know when we started um people are looking for solutions we're in a very i think what you could call a scary time for some people and we're yeah. in a very exciting time for me where we're seeing i think it's I, I feel blessed to be alive in a time where i can see that there are going to be major paradigm shifts happening yeah. uh, not that we can ever win or lose everything's a polarity but if we don't let them do what they're doing, uh, I see a wonderful time ahead for us yeah. if stuff like this happens and more people get on board. What kind of reaction are you getting from like allopathic doctors? Is it good? I mean, I don't, I don't, they ignore me, so I don't. Get it. <laughs> yeah. But you have but, people signing up and stuff. Yeah, How, we have people signing up and you, you know, it's, it's interesting we say that because it, a lot of times I will say, like, I'll be very critical of existing systems, whether it's social security, medicine, a whole lot of things. I mean, I, I'm, I don't like most of it. And then people say, well, yeah, but what are you going to replace it with? And it's in some ways a good question. In some ways, it's the wrong question. Because my tendency is to say, I don't have to worry about that. I'm just going to say what I think. And then people will, will individually and collectively start sorting it out. And if somebody comes up with a solution to, you know, poverty, I can tell you right now, it's not going to be right. <laughs> there are, you know, a, a millions of solutions. Uh, and millions of solutions to what should I do to be a healthier, happier person? You don't need me to say, now I can give you a certain framework to get out of the old. That's the main thing is get out of the old, think differently, see what's real, start there, then you'll figure it out. You don't need, we don't need some other top-down solution to this, whatever our problems are. Yeah. And I think it is always personalized, just the same with illness. You know, it's yeah. you and I could have the same dis-ease and it could be a totally different cause. To totally you know? different and, cause. And I've been saying that too, because uh, there was a guy, Buckminster Fuller. Yeah. And he always said, you do not defeat a system by attacking it. He says, you put your energy into making a new yeah. system that's better that makes the old one obsolete so that people will come to your system. Right. And I've been telling people recently, you know, I've been saying, if you're building a house, we're out building a new house on the land, but we've got an old decrepit shed in the back. Well, we're men. We can only do one thing at a time anyway. And the women can maybe do two, but we cannot build a house and knock down a shed at the same time. So are we going to build a house? Or are we going to put the tools down and go knock down the shed? And I see a lot of that happening, even in the movement you and I are involved in with the, the terrain versus that thing. I'm going to keep this YouTube friendly. Um, I, to me, I, I'm not attacking the, the Kennedys and Malones and all that. That's knocking down the shed. I'm saying, go ahead, do that. I'm going to show you what's yeah. up. And that's where my energy's gone. I yeah. don't care what Malone's saying. I don't give a damn. You know, you yeah. can say all you want, McCullough. To me, if these dudes don't get it, I don't want to be associated with it. I'm not even going to give them energy. Yeah. I'm, no, so that's what I like what you're doing. You're saying, screw this. Lanka did the same. He said, I already debunked the, the boogeyman. So I don't need to be in the future movement to keep debunking the boogeyman. I did it. <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's right. like, what do we do now? I mean, we're still, I think we need to still point out to people the flaws in that way of thinking. I mean, 
but but I I totally get it, and which is why we we you can't also sell this and by being angry and upset all the time and unhappy and unhealthy and pissed off, you know, and world sucks and everybody <laughs> sucks and and here come and join me. <laughs> why? <laughs> Let's all be miserable together. Yeah. Like, like I don't like. I'm not joining you. You, you know. But that's, anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Lead by example. Are you doing anything else, Tom? Are you writing any new books or uh, anything else we can look forward to? Uh, no books right now. Uh, not, not particularly. I'm just right. Yeah. I mean, I'm really getting, I, you know, I'm getting sick of talking about the boogeyman, but I agree with you. It's still, yeah. we, we need to pursue it, but a little bit, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting in, interested in like, like what you're talking about the heart. It's not a pump, you know, what we call immune, immune systems or cancer, metabolic function. There's, it's all BS. You know, all you can BS. even, you can control your breathing and change your heart rate. So that's proof right there. Your heart's not pumping or else how is your mind and breath like chain lines? <laughs> yeah. If the heart's just doing it, then how yeah. come you can just relax and change your breathing and change it? Like, come on. Well, you know, I, I, I recently got into this thinking about the, the cancer because that comes up a lot in the clinic and in the curriculum. Uh, it's an interesting uh, pr thought process because they say everybody knows cancer is when the cell there's a mutant cell right because it got a mutation and the cell is all messed up it's got funky number of chromosomes and it's misshapen etc and it grows way too fast and overtakes the rest of the system right that's basically cancer so i thought about this imagine something that's all broken like a car Somebody comes in, yeah, the, you know, my car's all broken. The engine's in three pieces and the steering wheel's in the trunk and the tires are flat and somebody cut the brake cables. And so you say, yeah, well, how's it running? Oh, runs three times faster than a normal car. You'd say, wait a minute. <laughs> so how is it that this broken, dysfunctional, mutated, abnormal chromosome cell is able to grow three times faster than a healthy cell <laughs> i i don't think that's right <laughs> yeah <laughs> and and that's the thing nobody ever questioned that and you know that's just the fact that and and everybody's treatment holistic and and conventional is killing these fast growing cells right You're gonna kill it because they're growing too fast I think the cells are just the excretion products of the tissue. Yeah, we don't even, like Hillman said, we don't even know if there are cells because we yeah. can't look at them in a body. Right. I, I think I heard you say to Abby, Eddie Bravo, you know, if I chop your hand off and then mush it up into a million pieces and look into yeah. a microscope, I can't figure out how a hand works. So yeah, are there even cells? We know there's red blood cells. We can see those, the bigger ones in white maybe, but... We don't even know if what's inside them is what we say is inside them. Yeah, let but even a red blood cell way. is is really an oxygen delivery apparatus. Bubble or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, I think yeah. these cells are just excretion products, which is why they're not going anywhere. They're not even dividing. See, cancer is a weird one. Maybe I'd like your opinion on this. So I'm with you that I think if you have garbage in your body, it's wrapping them up with what we call tumors to make sure maybe the garbage, the garbage bag. So it doesn't yeah. spread all over. And right. I know like when the doctor takes a biopsy, it's like they basically pop a hole in the protective coating and then all the poisons get out and Oh my God, it's spreading and metastasizing. Yeah. And you're like, that's because you popped a hole in it. But a lot of like um, the Taoist cancer treatments, they're still about attacking the tumor, even uh, using like um uh, castor oil or serpentine yeah. you know to um so do you really want to attack a tumor what's your opinion on that you know are you really trying to get the poison out from inside or do you want to be messing with tumors so my conclusion right now and i would this is the part that i would say is speculation 
not fact, is we're made of tissue and tissue is always, you know, it's always dying and regrowing just like normal. And so it, at the periphery of this tissue, it forms little cells and those slough off and then you get new tissue. If the tissue like your liver is poisoned, it obviously will make more faster cells that are not the right kind of like nice little bags of garbage. Like the, the, the normal ones are just bags of healthy excretion products. These ones are abnormal, misshapen, toxic stuff. And then the more you put in poisons, the faster the quote cells will form as your body tries to detoxify. And then it isn't that those cells travel through the blood and go to your spleen. It's that the liver is full and then the spleen is the next site. Just like if you put garbage in your house, you put it in a bag and that's fine. You take it out to the curb. But if you put twice as much, you got twice as many bags and then eventually put it in your spare bedroom and et cetera. And then it goes in your kitchen and then you're dead. So it's not a bad idea to take stinky garbage out of your house, right? Like that's fine. Uh, but don't, don't think that you've solved the problem. All you've done is given your house a little bit of a breather so that you can you know, maybe stop doing that and making more stinky garbage. So I think that's why you, some, you, you know, surgery and getting rid of tumors sometimes helps just because it, it lessens the burden. But right. To, yeah. I could also see, you know, there are situations where the tumors in your brain and it's so big, it's starting yeah. to press against other right. areas right. where it's dangerous to, I, I can see sometimes there is yeah. a need for surgery, but usually right. not. Yeah. Right. So not. there's sometimes it's a physical, like pressing pressure or something. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's also the same with DNA. And Oh, by the way, I saw you, uh, you read uh, Tracy Northern did a paper on uh, yeah. the amino age. She, it's a girl, by the way. I, you weren't sure if it's a he yeah. or a she. She's actually my co-author. I'm going to put a shameless plug in. Oh, wow. <laughs> she did all the illustrations for our children's book, The Dukes of Dents, which is on all Amazon. But she's a wonderful artist and a brilliant researcher. So Yeah, she is brilliant uh, researcher and writer. Amazing person. Yeah, brilliant, yeah. brilliant. Yeah, yeah, I've learned a lot. She's one of my yeah. teachers as well, so... Excellent. Well, we won't keep this too long, Tom. All right. I just want to say it's a pleasure to speak with you. And uh, I've... all right, Steve, <laughs> it's great to talk again. Thanks for excellent. Doing it. We'll we'll speak again, and I'll see you at the end of COVID. We're both in the uh, the yeah. upcoming end of COVID series, so looking forward to that too. All right, Steve. Thank you. All right, thanks, Tom. Have a great day. Okay. Bye bye.